In this presentation, we'll be discussing common dermatology disorders. This lecture was written by Ms. Jennifer Midlin, MS, FNP. Jennifer is an expert in the field of dermatology and works in a dermatology practice in Dayton, Ohio. Narration is provided by Dr. Tracy Murray. The purpose of this lecture is to introduce you to a few important and common dermatological disorders. These will include viruses, commonly seen primary care problems, and dermatitis. We'll review the clinical presentation of some of these disorders, the diagnostic tools, and treatment, as well as expected outcomes. There will be a review of differential diagnoses to go along with each skin condition. This lecture will help you develop your skills in diagnosing dermatological issues. There may be many skin issues that can resemble multiple diagnoses. Narrowing those diagnoses down by obtaining a thorough history, assessing the skin, and knowing some of the key dermatology conditions will help you in your practice. Common viral rashes or xanthems include the following, rubiola, rubella, varicella, Fitz disease, pityriasis rosea, hand, foot, and mouth disease, and molluscum contagiosum. First, we'll start off with rubiola, or the measles, which is from the species morbillivirus. This is a highly contagious virus spread through respiratory droplets. There's no cure for measles. However, the pediatric vaccine for measles has been around since 1963 and has virtually eradicated the, the disease. Most recent reports of measles are of patients not being vaccinated or those who have traveled outside the United States. A good question to ask your patient when presenting with a rash is if they've had any recent travel. A patient with measles will appear, appear very sick. They'll have a high fever, red mucosal membranes, conjunctivitis, and nasal congestion. The presentation of skin in a reddish purple generalized macular and papular rash will appear. Lesions start out on the hand, particularly on the face or behind the ears, and spread down the body within one to two days. The differential diagnosis includes a drug reaction, toxic shock syndrome, or other viral xanthems. Diagnostic blood work would include reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCR, and IgG and IgM. One important note is all positive cases must be reported to the CDC. Possible complications include pneumonia, bronchitis, myocarditis, and encephalitis. If a pregnant patient acquires measles, a miscarriage is a concern. Treatment for a patient with measles is symptomatic care with pain relievers, continue to monitor for a few weeks, and also watch for complications. Patients with measles are infectious four days before the onset of the rash and up to four days after the onset. The patient is able to return to work after the rash has subsided. Rubella, also known as German measles or three-day measles, is caused by the rubella virus. The rash may start two weeks after exposure and is spread from res respiratory droplets. The patient's history will conclude a low-grade fever, headache, sore throat, rhinorrhea, malaise, eye pain, and myalgia two to five days before the rash began. The skin rash will appear with rose pink macules and papules that first present on the head and travel down the body. This rash will fade in one to two days in the same order the lesions appeared. Differential diagnosis includes hypersensitivity reaction, contact dermatitis, scarlet fever, or other viruses. Rubella is a clinical diagnosis. Treatment is symptomatic care with acetaminophen, NSAIDs, and rest. The myalgias may last weeks after the virus outbreak. Prevention of rubella is vaccination. A patient can be infectious with the disease four to seven days before the rash, and can return to work or sports after the rash has cleared. 
Varicella is also known as the chickenpox. It's a highly contagious virus caused by the varicella zoster virus. Clinical presentation of malaise, fever, chills, headache, arthralgia, then one to two days later, the urticarial or, urticarial or itching erythematous macules and papules appear, which quickly turn into vesicles and pustules. The rash starts on the face and chest, then spreads quickly over the entire body. The blisters may even appear in the ear canal or the mouth. These lesions dry up within one week. The differential diagnosis includes bug bites, drug reaction, measles, and other viruses. Varicella is also a clinical diagnosis. Treatment is symptomatic care with oral antihistamines for itching, NSAIDs, cool compresses, and oatmeal baths. Prevention of chicken pox is, vac is through vaccination. A patient is considered contagious two to three days before the rash erupts and may return to school, sports, or work after the lesions have scabbed over. Roseola, also known as sixth disease, is caused by the human herpes virus type six and seven. The virus is usually mild and common in children under the age of two and is spread through saliva. It is short-lived, three to five days. The symptoms are high fever, irritability, diarrhea, cough, and cervical lymphadenopathy. The skin rash presents with light pink erythematous macules and papules on the face, neck, and extremities. The rash usually resolves in one to three days. Differential diagnosis includes measles, drug eruption, rubella, or other viral rashes. Diagnosing roseola is based on clinical presentation and history. Management of the virus is to treat the patient symptomatically. These patients are contagious one to two days before the fever starts and are able to return to activities once fever, fatigue, cough, or diarrhea have subsided. Fifth's disease is also known as erythema infectiosum or human parvovirus. This is spread through respiratory droplets and blood products. There are three stages to this virus. The patient starts with headache, fever, and chills, the possible cough. In stage one, there's a classic slapped cheek rash, bright red bilateral cheeks, which spare the forehead, nasal bridge, and perioral area. In stage two, Pink, lacy, or reticulated erythematous macules on all extremities and trunk spare the palms and the sole surfaces. The rash may can be itchy at this stage. And then in stage three, this is the two to three weeks of the body rash. This rash may come and go and can last up to two, three weeks. The differential diagnosis is phototoxic reaction, systemic lupus, drug eruption, and other viral xanthems. Diagnosis may be done by blood tests, but results will not be detected for three weeks after the rash. So it's not valuable because the patient should be symptom free by then. The lab test is IgG antibodies to parvovirus. The differential Diagnosis, again, is phototoxic reaction, systemic lupus, drug eruption, or other viruses. Management for patients is symptomatic care. They should be advised to avoid heat as this will exacerbate the rash. Patients with fifth disease are contagious days before they develop the rash and can return to activities after the initial signs and symptoms of headache, fever, and chills have subsided, even if there is still a rash. Pityriasis rosea has a viral ideology, but it's difficult to confirm. The majority of patients are from ages 10 to 35, and there's a greater ratio of females to males. It's more common for breakouts of the virus in the springtime, and clinical presentation is a solitary two to four centimeter patch or plaque on the trunk that starts two to three weeks prior to the general rash. This patch is known as the herald patch. 
The rash is pink to erythematous, round to oval placules and papules with possible scaly borders. Pityriasis rosea rash resembles the shape of a Christmas tree on the trunk. The face, palmar, and sole surfaces are usually spared. The rash can be itchy and the patient may have a low-grade fever, headache, and fatigue. The rash can possibly last one to two months or even longer. The differential diagnosis here for pityriasis rosea is tinea versicolor, drug eruption, and psoriasis. The diagnosis is made by history and physical. Management includes antihistamines, and unlike Fifth's disease, the sun could actually help the rash instead of exacerbate it. Acyclovir for one week may decrease the severity. Patients can be contagious seven to 14 days prior to the rash eruption. Returning to activities will depend on the patient's symptoms. By the time the rash has appeared though, the patient is not contagious anymore. Hand, foot, and mouth disease is a contagious virus, mostly occurring in young children. This virus is caused by the Coxsackie A16 and Enterovirus 71. Prior to the rash, the patient may have a low-grade fever, fatigue, or sore throat one to two days prior to the rash. The virus skin presentation is vesicles on the hands and feet with mouth sores. Mouth sores are in almost 90% of the cases, usually the first sign. There can be more than 10 mouth apthi sores anywhere in the oral cavity and frequently are asymptomatic. The hand vesicles appear with erythematous halos and appear mostly on the soles and palms. Vesicles might appear on the legs, buttocks, and face. The lesions do usually resolve around seven days. The differential should include varicella and herpes. Diagnosis is made by history and physical, and differential should include varicella and herpes. The management is symptomatic care for the patient. The patient or the patient's parents need reassurance that there won't be scarring and or that it's not some other rare skin disorder. The patient's considered contagious four to six days prior to outbreak and should not return to school or activities until the lesions are scabbed over. Molluscum contagiosum is from the family of Poxviridae. This virus is encased in a protective sac that prevents the immune system from being triggered. The skin presentation is tiny pustules, which are two to five millimeters, and some even have a slight depression in the center of the flesh-colored dome. A single lesion or multiple lesions may occur. They're spread through contact, scratching, auto-inoculation, or shaving. The most common places on children are thighs and arms, but the adult presentation is primarily the genital region spread from sexual contact. Soles and palms are always spared. Some patients present with erythematous papules and scales from the itching. Due to inoculation or auto-inoculation, the virus can last up to eight months or longer. The differential includes genital warts, hypersensitivity reaction, folliculitis in the genital region. Diagnosis is made by history and examination and often are misdiagnosed as genital warts. Management includes non-prescription over-the-counter medications for molluscum, such as zymoderm, can be used. Personally, I've found this to be beneficial only in approximately 50% of the patients that have tried it. Oral topical retinoids may be helpful. Oral cimetidine or tagamet, 40 milligrams per kilogram per day, for two months can also be tried and cryosurgery with liquid nitrogen can be for performed. However, there may be scarring or hypopigmentation of the skin, so educating the parent or patient before this therapy is important. Anticipatory guidance should be provided to the patient and or parents regarding potential for scarring and contagiousness. It's important to note that studies have not found a single treatment to be more beneficial than another. Typically, treatment is by trialing any or all of the above to find the most effective. 
If a patient does have molluscum, they should be excluded from activities or sports such as gymnastics or wrestling until they are symptom free or they must keep them covered. Switching gears a little bit, these next two conditions are also commonly seen in primary care, but they do not have a viral origin. They are folliculitis and group A strep. Folliculitis may be caused by bacteria, fungus, or yeast. The most common cause is from gram-positive bacteria, Staph aureus. The clinical presentation is little pustules or erythema surrounding the base of the hair follicle. In my practice, the diagnosis is usually made by assessment, location, and history from the patient. In other words, it's usually a clinical diagnosis. However, if the rash is not responding to your treatment, you may need to obtain a culture and sensitivity from the small pustule on the surface of the skin to definitively identify the offending pathogen. A KOH prep can be performed to determine if the source is from fungus or yeast rather than bacterial. Again, I would do this if the patient did not respond to my initial treatment. The differential for folliculitis should include any type of popular or pustule, papular or pustule rashes such as acne, varicella, and papular eczema. This picture is an example of hot tub folliculitis. Of course, a history of hot tub use would be needed to support this diagnosis. Treatment is with topical antibiotic creams or ointments. In some cases, if the rash involves a surface area not practical to be covered entirely by cream, an oral antibiotic and topical cream may be needed. A few examples of oral antibiotics used for folliculitis are doxycycline, 100 mg BID for 14 days, or Bactrim DS, BID for 7 to 10 days. For those prone to repeated episodes of folliculitis, I have those patients wash with chlorhexidine antibacterial wash two times weekly ongoing to help them keep staph on the skin to a minimum. Now abscesses are a sac or a pore filled with a collection of pus that can occur in any part of the body. The common bacteria for an abscess is staph aureus. A furuncle is an infection that involves the hair follicle and can extend into the surrounding tissue. These occur mostly on the axilla, neck, and buttock. A carbuncle is a cluster of abscesses that connect subcutaneously and form one mass. Clinical presentation of an abscess is an erythematous tender nodule that can become fluctuant. Some patients' abscesses um, have ruptured before they even get to their appointment. The differential diagnosis includes drug eruption, group A streptococcus, and bug bites. Encourage keeping the area clean and apply warm compresses three times daily until the skin is improved. Cover with bandages if there's still drainage. Treatment for an abscess that is fluctuant, which means it's able to move or be compressed under the skin mass, is incision and drainage. The provider would numb the area with lidocaine, make a small incision, and apply pressure to express the pus. Obtain a culture of the pus to identify the bacteria for appropriate oral antimicrobial treatment. Cover with mupirocin or Vaseline and a nonstick bandage. Warm compresses can be applied three times a day. The patient's discomfort is usually lessened after the pressure is released from the incision and drainage. I usually empiric empirically cover these patients with a broad spectrum antibiotic until the culture result is back with sensitivities. Moving on, group A strep is caused by the streptococcus bacteria, which can cause scarlet fever. Streptococcal rashes present as red sandpaper-like rashes and it feels just like that. The patient will have a fever, bright red sore throat, lymphadenopathy, and bright red skin in the skin folds like the underarms, elbows, and groin. A provider might see this in a primary care setting or urgent care, but a dermatologist's office rarely sees these patients as they're usually already diagnosed and treated by their primary care provider. 
The differential diagnosis includes a viral rash, drug rash, and contact dermatitis. Use a rapid strep test by swabbing the throat or sending a throat culture for laboratory testing to make the diagnosis. Oral antibiotics such as penicillin or amoxicillin are the treatment of choice, and your differential should include viral rash, drug rash, and contact dermatitis, as I said. These next dermatological disorders are the more common disorders a provider in dermatology deals with on a daily basis, and you can expect to deal with them as well. Acne is a condition that is manageable, but not curable. The provider must emphasize this to their patients, so there are realistic expectations. Now, acne can occur at any age, and there are different levels of severity. Acne is classified into three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is a patient with a few papules and pustules. Moderate acne patients have papules, pustules, and nodules. And severe acne consists of papules, multiple pustules, and multiple nodules that can be painful. Acne lesions can appear on the face, the neck, the chest, the back, and the upper arms. The differential diagnosis should include rosacea, folliculitis, and perioral oral dermatitis. People often ask what foods cause acne, and there's a common belief it's that too much chocolate or greasy foods promote it. The only correlation to any food is the possibility of increasing breakouts with a diet high in low-fat milk. In 2005, a retrospective study was conducted in which 47,000 adult women were asked to recall their high school diet and if they ever had a physician diagnosed severe acne. The study found that acne was positively associated with the reported quantity of milk ingested, particularly skim milk. A similar repeated study was done in 2013 with similar findings. I educate my patients that a healthy diet is necessary for any physical condition and your skin is your largest organ, so an all-around healthy diet will promote healthy skin. Every acne patient should be using a good cleanser. A good cleanser should have benzoyl peroxide or should have salicylic acid in it. Benzoyl peroxide can be drying and does tend to bleach towels or sheets, so make sure you educate your patient and parents on these side effects. Treating mild acne is best accomplished with a good cleanser and a retinoid with the possibility of a topical antibiotic. For a moderate case of acne, one would prescribe a retinoid, a topical antibiotic, and oral antibiotics. Adepiline is the lowest potency retinoid and good to use for mild acne. Retin-A micro is a mid-potency retinoid and good to start with for mild or moderate acne. A patient with moderate acne will need a good cleanser, medium to high potency retinoid, topical antibiotics, and oral antibiotics. And for severe acne, treatment includes a good cleanser, topical and oral antibiotics, as well as a medium to high potency retinoid. Let's talk about Accutane now, or isotretinoin. Isotretinoin is a powerful drug used to treat moderate to severe acne. It's a derivative of vitamin A, which is an option for moderate to severe acne that has failed other treatment options and in whom scarring is a concern. The patient takes the medication for four to six months and some patients may need a second round of treatment. The medication can cause elevation in triglyceride and liver enzymes. So labs need to be monitored prior to starting medication at midpoint and at completion. There's a possible risk of developing an inflammatory bowel disorder and a slight increased, re increased risk of suicide from depression. Therefore, patients need to be properly evaluated and advised of this prior to treatment. The most common side effect is chapped lips, which can be really severe, and just dryness of the skin overall. 
Accutane will cause serious birth defects if taken during pregnancy, so all female patients who are on Accutane must be tested for pregnancy prior to treatment and started on an oral contraceptive. Patients should be referred to dermatology for Accutane treatment. Moving on, our next type of rash is tinea, or also known as fungal infections. Tinea can happen on different parts of the body and therefore will have different medical terms to identify which part of the body the infection is on. This lecture will not cover all of the possible tinea diagnoses, just the most common causes. Tinea pedis, or athlete's foot, occurs obviously on the feet. The clinical presentation is erythematous, scaly, and possible inflammation or itching on the feet. Treatment is an antifungal cream and vinegar soaks or burrow solution soaks to decrease the itch. Ketoconazole is the topical treatment of choice and is used for at least four weeks, if not longer, to resolve symptoms. I always have my patient use an over-the-counter antifungal spray for all of their shoes during and after treatment. Sometimes systemic antifungals like terbanifene are needed for prolonged or severe cases. Tinea cruis is also known as jock itch. The skin rash can present on the inner thighs, buttocks, groin area, and are well demarcated erythematous or tan plaques with raised scaly borders. Treatment is a topical antifungal, and if patients have repetitive infections, the use of over-the-counter Zeabsorb powder is an antifungal powder which I advise patients to use routinely, which can help prevent fungal breakouts on the skin. Tinea corporis, or ringworm as it's known, is a fungal infection on the extremities or trunk. The classic presentation of ringworm is an erythematous annual, annular lesion with scaly macules and papules and a well-defined edge. The lesion may be itchy. The edge of, edge of the lesion is raised and the center of the lesion is flattened. This lesion can be small or can cover a large body surface area. The treatment will be an antifungal topical cream or an antifungal agent like terbanifene if the lesion is widespread. Follow-up for these patients with any fungal infection is three to four weeks to make sure that they're improving. Tinea unguum, also known as oncomycosis, is a fungal infection of the fingernails or toenails. Oncomycosis is a very common and frustrating condition for patients. The clinical appearance of the nails may vary and might be yellowish, greenish, sometimes black, or white ridging with possible cracking of the nails. Treatment of choice will be determined by the severity and the patient's age. A topical agent such as Cyclopyrox nail lacquer 8% applied daily for months at the base of the nail is a good choice. An oral antifungal like terbanifene 250 mg daily for two weeks has a high cure rate, but the patient has to have a healthy liver in order to use oral antifungals, so a comprehensive metabolic panel should be done prior to initiation of the medication. Provider education is key since the process to cure a fungal infection of the nails is very slow. Nails take an average of four to six months to grow out and toenails take an average of eight to 10 months to grow out. Warts are caused by the human papillovirus. Because the body does not always identify the virus, warts can last a long time without treatment. Warts can be found anywhere on the body, but the most frustrating area to treat are the warts on the hands, feet, and genitalia. Clinical presentations of warts is a skin-colored, rough papule that sometimes has a grayish surface. The papule interrupts normal skin lines. It's common to see single lesions or clusters of lesions ranging from less than a millimeter to greater than a centimeter in size. Observation of tiny black or red dots may be seen in the lesion from the thrombosed capillaries, and some patients will incorrectly refer to these as the seeds. Warts are diagnosed by clinical observation, and sometimes a biopsy is necessary. 
Treatment is usually a series of treatments. As a provider, you'll need to prepare the patient for the fact that it'll take time to get rid of these. Salicylic acid, topically with patches or liquid form, is the first treatment option, and most patients have tried this at home before coming in for an appointment. Pairing the skin and the use of liquid nitrogen is the most common treatment for warts performed by a provider. The liquid nitrogen is applied three times in a freeze-thaw cycle on the wart, meaning the provider sprays or applies the liquid nitrogen until the wart turns white, then it thaws back to flash color in about 30 seconds, and then the process is repeated. The average amount of treatments is six to eight treatments, four, to week, four weeks apart. Duct tape occlusion involves putting duct tape on at night, leaving it on all night for multiple weeks, or putting the duct tape on and leaving it in place for four to six days, removing the tape, soaking the area, pairing the skin, and repeating the process until it's resolved. Cantheridin is a blistering agent applied topically by the provider to the wart, covered with tape, and the patients to wash it off four to six hours after treatment. The application is painless, but the blistering process that occurs afterwards can cause discomfort. This medication cannot be used on the face or on the genitalia area. Treatment for genital warts is cryotherapy or amicumid applied three times a day at bedtime with a maximum of 16 weeks of treatment. Now let's move on to scabies. Scabies and head lice are common conditions in school-aged children that you may be asked to treat. Scabies is caused by a tiny parasite that infects the skin. This condition is highly contagious by physical contact with another person or contaminated fabric. The patient will present with intense itching that is worse at night. Light pink curved or linear burrows occasionally seen with a black dot on one end representing the mite are pathognomonic for but not always seen. Common places for burrows to be found are in between the webs of the fingers and the toes. Treatment includes both medication and treatment of the patient's environment at home. Permethrin 5% topical cream is prescribed and the patient must, be, must put it on the entire body from the neck down at nighttime, sleep with the cream on, and wash it off in the morning. I tell my patients to get every crease and crevice on their bodies from the neck down. After the treatment, the patient is to treat all linens and clothes by washing in hot water, and then they repeat the same process in one week. All family members who are in the house should be treated empirically to prevent spreading or repeat outbreak. Another treatment may be the use of ivermectin orally. The appropriate dose is 200 milligrams per kilogram, and again, this treatment is repeated in one week. The medication is used in combination with the topical permethrin. Caution should be used in patients with asthma when using ivermectin. Actinic keratosis is another type of common skin lesion that you'll see and is a result of cumulative sun exposure and aging. About 25% of Americans will develop AK in their lifetimes, some of which may not appear until years after extensive sun exposure. These are considered precancerous lesions, but less than 25% of the lesions turn into squamous cell carcinoma. However, there's no way to determine the prognosis of these lesions, therefore treatment is necessary for all. Monitoring these patients for progression of these lesions or the production of new actinic keratosis is important. Clinical presentation of AKs are rough textured skin that may be flesh or pink in color. Some may become thick scaly and can evolve into plaques. The patient may complain of a stinging sensation when they rub their finger over the area. They may also state the lesion never goes away no matter how much moisturizer is used. Sun exposure increases the characteristic of AKs. I tell my patients it's like opening Pandora's box. Once you get one and then you go into the sun, 
most of the time more will appear over time. If a provider is unsure of the type of lesion, a biopsy is necessary by using a shave biopsy method. This biopsy should be sent to a dermatopathologist or pathologist to have the correct diagnosis. The differential diagnosis for actinic keratosis is psoriasis, eczema, wart, and squamous cell carcinoma. Treatment consists of cryotherapy with liquid nitrogen, which will destroy the lesion and the tumor cells will blister, scab, and fall off, which usually results in smooth skin in one to two weeks. Always educate the patient on the possibility of hypopigmentation if this procedure is done, and the patient may be concerned about the cosmetic effects. Immunotherapy is another choice for treatment of actinic keratosis. There are multiple medications that are approved as topical agents. A few examples are amiquimid and 5-fluorouracil. These medications are applied for two to six weeks and will cause irritation and scabbing wherever there is actinic damage. Close monitoring of these patients is key and clearly explaining the expectations of the treatment is important for the provider to follow through. Finally, the last common skin condition that we're going to discuss in this lecture is vitiligo. Vitiligo, some may know it as the Michael Jackson disease, is a condition of the skin when the melanocytes malfunction and lose pigmentation, therefore causing depigmented areas on the skin. This condition is unpredictable and can happen to a person of any ethnicity. There could be a hereditary factor or possibly an autoimmune issue associated with the disorder. The clinical presentation of a patient with vitiligo is well demarcated, depigmented white macules or patches surrounded by normal skin. These depigmented patches may expand and become irregularly shaped. Diagnosis is made by clinical observation and possible blood work if there is a concern for an autoimmune disorder. Topical corticosteroids are the first line of treatment for small areas. The steroid is applied daily for two months, and if there is repigmentation, continue the therapy. If there is no effect, the patient is to stop the topical regimen. Phototherapy is an option for large areas of depigmentation. The patient should be referred to dermatology for this option of treatment. Educating the patient on the necessity to keep the hypopigmented areas sun protected with sunscreen or clothing and on using cover-up makeup to blend the areas for cosmetic reasons is also beneficial. Now, contact dermatitis is an allergic reaction to a substance that produces an immune reaction in your skin, resulting in a very puritic and erythemic rash. Substances commonly known to cause allergic reactions in some people include nickel, antibiotic creams, cosmetics, soaps, fragrances, fragrances, jewelry, and plants like poison ivy. Contact dermatitis usually occurs on the area of the body that's been directly exposed to the reaction within minutes to hours of exposure. Contrary to popular belief, contact dermatitis, such as poison ivy, is not contagious and it can't be spread from one area of the body to another by touching it. The areas in which the oil of the leaf come in contact with the skin at the highest concentration will erupt first. Lower concentrations erupt later, often producing the misconception that the person must have touched the original rash which caused it to spread. Treatment is removal of the substance causing the reaction and mostly symptomatic. Topical antihistamine and steroid creams are available over the counter and are effective for mild reactions. Oral antihistamine should be used to combat itching. In more severe cases, a tapering dose of oral steroids is recommended, or if the allergic reactions are on the face, in particular around the eyes. Patients should be educated that if the oil from the plant leaves are on their clothes, Repeat exposure when touching it, like doing laundry, for example, can cause another outbreak. Precautions should be taken to immediately wash clothing when exposed to wooded areas or plants if exposure is unknown. 
Contact dermatitis can lead to secondary infection in the area if repeatedly scratched. The last type of dermatitis we're going to talk about is atopic dermatitis, also known as eczema. Atopic dermatitis is a disorder that is the result of a gene variation that affects the skin's ability to retain moisture and protection from irritants. Thus, people with eczema are more likely to be affected by environmental irritants. Atopic dermatitis is often associated in people with asthma or hay fever. Flares can be triggered by a variety of food or environmental exposures. Symptoms of atopic dermatitis are patches of itchy, dry skin. Patches can be red to brownish gray in color and may also have small raised vesicles that leak when scratched. Most cases of atopic dermatitis begin before the age of five and persist into adulthood. Treatment is symptomatic much like contact dermatitis. Topical steroid creams and oral antihistamines are often used. Care should be taken to moisturize the skin at least twice per day, and patients should be advised to avoid triggers that worsen the rash, including sweat, stress, offending foods, and plants.